South Africa remains a society profoundly marred by violence. It continues to deal with the enduring effects of decades of institutionalized racism, racism, sexism, exclusion, structural violence, as well as other factors that have persistently undermined human development and positive social cohesion. There's a seminal study that's been released by the Human Sciences Research Council and Dr. Mpumi Zungu, the strategic lead and acting director at the HSRC, joins me now. Dr. Zungu, good morning and thank you very much for your time. It does make for interesting but really troublesome reading uh, the details of this report. And you basically set about, to my understanding, in simple terms, to just create some kind of understanding and benchmark of the, the profile of GBV in the country. And I was listening to a prominent gender activist um, this morning say, this really is a game changer in the way that we understand and, and, and we map GBV in South Africa. So just talk to us about how you set about doing this really important piece of work. And welcome to the program, by the way. Thank you so much, uh, Imani. I, um, it, it is really heartwarming to hear the feedback coming from activists because we wouldn't have this study really without the activists. And many of us will remember the 1st of August in 2021, when women marched to the union building and others across the country to demand that government does something about gender-based violence. And among those de uh, demands was that we need to have a, a nationally representative uh, survey that would give us data to be able to understand the magnitude of uh, gender-based violence. And that is what we did. Uh, it took a while to be able to get here, but uh, we are grateful that uh, we, we are finally here. The yes. study was designed to be able to give us prevalence uh, for two things, uh, for victimization and uh, different forms of violence, but also we looked at perpetration. So the data that we released yesterday, we're giving you a picture about what has uh, happened over a lifetime. So we have a data for lifetime prevalence. Then we have data that tells you in a period of 12 months, what has taken place in terms of physical violence and, uh, and, and also sexual. And also we also combine the two numbers when we look both at uh, physical and or sexual uh, violence. And so let's go to the lifetime um, profile then of, uh, of violence. And the, this one piece as well, you know, it, it really just shares and, and sheds light on, particularly when it comes to child, childhood experiences, of violence, and I want to share some of the numbers with our viewers as it relates to, to males and to females. So women, childhood history of violence before the age of 15, physical abuse, 58%, sexual abuse, 4%. And then for men before the ages of eight, the age of 18, physical abuse, 74.6%, sexual abuse, 15.7%. And it connects to the adage of, you know, hurt people hurt people, and that those who are often victims of abuse will become abusers later in their in, in their lives. Does this conform with what we see in South Africa in terms of uh, women being the targeted group for abuse and violence, women and children? Definitely. The, the data that we have conforms to what we have known, but also um, there's new data that uh, has come up. For an example, if we look at uh, physical IPV and look at the factors that are associated with being a victim uh, of IPV, especially for women. One of the things that uh, uh, are, are very, very uh, profound that comes from the data is that witnessing abuse of your mother by a partner actually puts you at risk. Having experienced uh, physical or also sexual and, and emotional abuse also puts you at, at risk. While on the other side for men, it is being bullied or bullying uh, uh, someone else. So you can see that these childhood traumas um, sort of put us in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a risk of either we are perpetrating or a, a, a being victims of um, a, a violence. You know, we, we often say, and in fact, one of the foundational or one of the catalytic factors for you uh, as the HSRC conducting the study was looking at the background in South Africa of GBV disproportionately affecting um, women and girls. But if we look at this number, men before the ages of 18, 74.6% physical abuse, sexual abuse, 
15.7%, women uh, or, or girls, 58% on physical abuse and 4% on sexual abuse. That, that's sharing a slightly more complex and different picture. Just help us mm -hmm. understand those numbers. It does. It does. I, I, mean, I think for, for, for the first time, one is able to get um, data uh, that points to uh, boys, because remember we interviewed uh, adults uh, from uh, from 18 uh, and above, but we asked them about their childhood experiences. So the data that we have gives us that picture. And what is it saying is that our focus often is on on girls when we when we especially when we talk about sexual abuse. But you can see the numbers that we are seeing here. And even for the for the uh, uh, females, we believe that that number is actually maybe to do with uh, not disclosing. It, it should be a little bit higher than what we are seeing. So for us to see those high numbers for for boys, uh, for men, it is it is really staggering, and it does suggest that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to deal with the uh, gender-based violence. We cannot have over three million men who have a history of uh, um, sexual abuse in our, in, in our country. And I'm sure most of them have never uh, accessed health or, or, or any intervention, psychological, uh, emotional, and so on. Because, you know, the whole thing around sexual abuse is that it is kept a secret. Um, you know, a child is threatened uh, not to talk, um, even when sometimes they disclose, uh, the family will rally around and make sure that uh, whatever is being reported doesn't go to authorities. Yeah. So this is pointing to what needs to happen and they, they, that we need to be sensitive to these issues. And in our recommendation, we deal with the issue of, ch of child abuse, that we need to make sure that services for child abuse are accessible to boys the same way that they are accessible to girls. So it's raising consciousness around yeah. uh, boys. Do, do we have to, and, and I've just got two quick things to ask you. I really wish we had so much more time because I think this is uh, such a really interesting and valuable report. Do we have to ha add a caveat to the sentence GBV disproportionately affects women and girls uh, in terms of age? The caveat being that we have to say depending on the age that they are, because it certainly seems under the age of 18 that men and well, boys, young men and boys are disproportionately f affected. But that profile changes as those who are abused become abusers later on in life. Definitely, um, we, we need to put that caveat. And I think it, it's never our aim to, to make it look like, you know, there's this binary way of looking at violence as something that... Uh, another group cannot cannot experience. And if you look at the report, you will see that we actually spend some time also looking at men as victims. We looked at exposure to violence outside the home, but also we asked women, have you beaten up your partner when they were not uh, uh, beating you up? And 7.8% 7, 7 of women said yes. So we also need to look at this part of men as victims, even outside the home. I mean, if, if men are being beaten up by other men, guns, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, being pointed at them. So that kind of violence in itself is causing the problem, but it's, it's, a, it's a societal problem that we also manifest yeah. within the home. Dr. Zungu, really, honestly, a, a, as you read and page through the graphs and the findings, it, it makes for important and thought-provoking reading. Um, we know also from the report that education also seems to be playing a role. It seems that better educated women are faring better. If you want, you can comment on that. But I want to focus on this final thing. A lifetime of physical violence significantly affecting black women well, in higher proportions, 33%. Mm -hmm. And it's also higher between the ages of 18 and 24. And what's also mm -hmm. interesting is that this affects cohabiting and unmarried mm -hmm. women. So what's the story there? Are women who are, you know, better educated and married less prone to, 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 to violence? You, you see the role of education differently, <laughs> um, uh, Iman. For an example, when you look at emotional abuse, it's women with a tertiary education who reported the most uh, emotional abuse. And it makes sense because the, 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 the minute you become independent, there's almost a pushback to remind you that you are a woman. So 
you are seeing that that relationship between education that it's not protecting you, but actually it might even be putting you more at risk. So even our interventions, we cannot just press a button and say empower women only. We need to be working with men. In terms of the cohabiting, it's a, it's a, it's a, as far as I know, it's a new result. We have never seen in any data on, 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 gender, on, on gender-based violence where we are seeing this cohabiting as one of the factors. People who are cohabiting, not married, uh, experiencing a more violence compared to the groups that are married and those that are in a relationship but not cohabiting with the, with the partner. So we need to do more analysis, dig a little bit deeper, but also maybe look at doing additional work where we interview couples to try and understand what are the dynamics that makes this relate, uh, relationship different from those that are married, uh, you know, legally, have, have gone and signed at home affairs and have a certificate yeah. somewhere or have been married culturally. And uh, I, I know that there's a call to action because what you want to see is um, that there will be targeted policy as a result of these uh, findings that you've made. And we will hopefully see a reduction in those numbers, hopefully a neutralization of this toxicity in our society altogether. But thank you so much for your time. And if you want to find out more, that report is available. That was Dr. Mpumi Zungu, the Strategic Lead and Acting Executive Director at the Human Sciences Research Council.